The rise of corporations in the 1600s, uh, particularly large shareholder-owned corporations, uh, created a, a significant change in the way that insurance had been uh, marketed to the people. In particular, by creating an insurance company, they were able to break out of the old notion that insurers had to have particularly deep pockets. The reason for this was that insurance was a bilateral contract, which meant that historically, insurers like the Genoese merchant who provided insurance in 1347 needed to be independently wealthy. However, if we could pool the resources of insuring parties together into a corporation, then we could scale up not only the amount of policies uh, that could be written, but this would also allow the insurers to diversify some of their risks because of the scale at which they would be operating. Now, of course, simply scaling up a pool of risks um, not only provides benefits for diversification, but it also frees up all of the self-insurance capital that had otherwise uh, been tied up, which meant that not only could individuals free up some of their capital, but it also meant that premiums being paid to insurance companies could actually be invested into assets that would provide some sort of yield for them in order to support any kinds of claims that get made. On top of all of that, a firm um, specialized in delivering insurance products could hire specialized underwriters or specialized adjusters who could help evaluate price and oversee the payouts that were being made on certain kinds of risks, a, the sort of sophistication that an individual insurer might not be able to bring. Now, the first modern insurance company that we see uh, is the cooperative organization known as the Hamburger Führerkasse, uh, or the Hamburg Fire Department which is still in existence today. It's effectively a mutualized pool with over 200,000 members who agree to insure each other against the uh, damages caused by fires. This sort of deal actually originated back in 1591 between 101 brewers in the city of Hamburg who all agreed to mutually insure each other uh, against the possibility of large fiery destruction of their assets. But we see significant evolution of this happening even further uh, in the 1700s. In the um, 1700s, particularly in the lead up to the bubble of 1720, we see two insurance companies beginning to emerge uh, in England, one known as the Royal Exchange Assurance Company and the other known as London Assurance. Both of these companies had <clears throat> sent out petitions to the British government asking for the permission to establish a corporate insurer. Uh, one that would be allowed to grow in large scale without necessarily having to wait for mutualized insurance uh, <clears throat> insured parties to join up. Now, of course, their objective here was diversification through scale, and they hoped ultimately that they would be able to rationalize or improve the pricing of British marine insurance given the scale of Britain's uh, <clears throat> merchant fleet in the early 1700s. Better than they had originally anticipated in the early lead up to the bubble, uh, when the Bubble Act was finally passed in 1720, the insurance companies not only got the right to offer marine insurance, but they were given exclusive duopolies over marine insurance, uh, with just small carve outs being left for individual underwriters. <clears throat> Now, of course, this led to spectacular increases in the price of these companies' shares. In fact, we see Royal uh, Exchange Assurance multiplying its price by a factor of 10 and London Assurance rising by as much as a factor of 40. Now, the main reason for the kind of investor exuberance around these particular firms was based on the notion that they would try to push their, uh, the limits of their business beyond what had been strictly chartered for them uh, by the British Parliament. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, they had the right to engage as a duopoly in marine insurance, but it took less than a, uh, four weeks for both firms to be engaged in selling other forms of insurance as well, perhaps hoping to push or extend the limits of their charter. However, later that year, the government indicated that it might very well uh, bring legal action against both of these companies for selling fire insurance, which they weren't permitted to do uh, under their legal duopoly granted by the Bubble Act. And as a result, people's expectations that this sort of multi-line insurance business uh, would ultimately be um, torn down. People had an expectation that they would be able to diversify not only within the marine insurance space, but also diversify across a number of different kinds of risks, providing an even greater uh, <clears throat> diversification benefit than simply having multiple policies exposed to similar kinds of risks. 
So with these dreams of vast diversification and vast scale, almost unlimited according to the stock promoters, uh, we see that the prices of both insurance companies begin a rather steep decline uh, later in that year as the dreams of simply having an unfettered charter and an insurance company that could write all kinds of policies uh, were ultimately torpedoed. Now that said, today's modern insurers are built up around this concept of a multi-line firm, and they've got a number of different kinds of insurance products that are being offered to people, whether we're looking at professional liability or malpractice insurance, medical costs, uh, the loss of key personnel for certain kinds of businesses. I'm sure we're all familiar with the ubiquitous flight cancellation insurance. We've got insurance against the contents of our houses being stolen. There are insurance against natural disasters, crop destruction, uh, against the possibility of unexpected legal expenses. You've got insurance against kidnap and ransom. You've got insurance against the possibility of non-payment by sovereigns. You can buy insurance for the health of your pets. Pretty much every kind of insurance is offered. And usually these are not only offered by singular focused specialty firms, but rather by modern, large, um, multi-line insurance companies. Now, another particular risk that people are interested in insuring against is the possibility of what I would uh, call early demise. <laughs> in fact, in 2019, almost half of the total premiums paid around the world were for life insurance products. And the first type of term life insurance product we see being issued uh, was in 1583 to William Gibbon of London. Uh, however, this was a term policy that would only paid out if he died during a particular window of time. It takes almost 130 years for the first permanent insurance to begin to emerge with Amicable Society for a Perpetual Assurance Office offering a permanent life insurance policy starting in 1706. But any of these kinds of early life insurance policies uh, were ultimately pretty crudely priced, because even though people may have had some idea about life expectancy, uh, the idea was that these weren't properly inculcated into the risks that people faced uh, until about 1743, uh, with the creation of Scottish ministers' widows' funds uh, by Robert Wallace. The idea was simply uh, that Scottish ministers who had the permission to marry but were not allowed to accumulate wealth uh, would want to buy some kind of insurance that would protect their spouse and any of their dependents from this possibility of early demise. Because while their families may have been cared for while the minister was alive and a member of the church, when that minister died, they generally had just a few months worth of money before they were reduced to punery and cast out into the streets. And so the <laughs> Ministers themselves established a fund that would be used to protect uh, their dependents. And Wallace's projections of what kinds of uh, rates people would have to pay uh, were legendarily precise. In fact, an audit decades later found that the uh, fund was only off by a total of four pounds from what it had been uh, estimated to require uh, during this particular time. So the reason this worked out so well, ultimately, is that Wallace invested the firm's uh, portfolio into <clears throat> specifically long-term government debts issued by the government of Great Britain, which made them highly predictable in terms of the cash flows that they would generate. On the liability side of the firm's balance sheet, it needed to have a pretty reasonable idea of when it was that people uh, who were insured might ultimately die. Now, making that kind of forecast for any individual uh, is not statistically possible, but if we ensure a sufficiently large group of people, then we can begin to make reasonable estimates about how many of them might die at, say, age 52 or age 63 or age 79. In order to get this actuarial life table built, one of the things we have to recognize is that the organization doing this was the church, which had baptism and burial records for people going back in their jurisdiction hundreds of years. So by using this kind of act, this proto-actuarial data on lifespans for individuals and marrying this to some of the statistical techniques that were evolving around this time, <clears throat> Wallace was able to make highly precise estimates for exactly what kinds of premiums needed to be charged in order to offset the risks faced by this sort of insurance pool. Now, this model was very widely replicated, uh, and life insurance spread outward from this uh, model, such that by 1762, uh, English Equitable establishes a mutualized or member-owned life insurance company offering permanent insurance contracts based off the template of the Scottish Minister's Widows Fund. Now, 
in addition to uh, the sort of treasure trove of Wallace's data, what's important here is the marrying of this data set to quantitative statistical techniques that had been de getting developed uh, over the prior century, century and a half, leading up to uh, the creation of the Scottish Widows Ministers Fund. And as people made more and more use of these statistical techniques, they were able to more accurately estimate the probabilities of certain kinds of routine events that would occur with some regularity. Now, of course, this is predicated on the notion that historical systems would be approximately replicated in the future, such that if there was a stormy season in the Atlantic, for instance, it would be the same stormy season every year. And if certain routes were exposed to piracy, that certain routes would continue to remain exposed to piracy. <laughs> now, this actuarial sort of revolution, uh, where we're actually using historical data and quantitative statistical methods, uh, ultimately made its way back down to London. Uh, outside of the Royal Exchange had been for many years a, a speculative uh, market in <clears throat> marine insurance centered around Edward Lloyd's coffee house. Now, this market for marine insurance had persisted despite the Bubble Act handing over control of most marine insurance to Royal Exchange Assurance and London Assurance back in 1720. Uh, nonetheless, there had been a carve out that was provided for individual insurers, and they typically met at uh, Edward Lloyd's Coffee House in order to offer their products to various sea captains. Uh, now, in time, Lloyd's Coffee House grew to be regarded as a den of speculators. Effectively, you had people who were simply making estimates about what the risk would be without the use of quantitative statistical techniques or even necessarily historical data. Well, in 1769, a, a, a roughly a generation after the creation of Scottish Widows Ministers Fund, we see a group of professional underwriters led by John Angerstein, who break away from the old Lloyd's Coffee House and establish their own new Lloyd's Coffee House. And this group began by <clears throat> uh, to estimating the risks that were faced on their insurance contracts by using historical data gained from a very wide information network and estimated the risks that they faced and thus the premiums they would need to set based off of the emerging statistical sciences of the day. Now, as you might imagine, this level of quantification of risk enabled them ultimately to make better assessments of the risks that they actually face and more appropriately price contracts, which gave them a competitive advantage over the speculators of the old Lloyds of London, ultimately leading the original Edward Lloyd's coffee house to be closed and replaced with the relatively new one that ultimately grew into Lloyd's of London, which is today the world's largest insurance market. <clears throat> 